Good morning. Welcome. Glad you're here. If we haven't met, uh, my name is Pastor Jake. I'm the Connections Pastor here at New Life. Uh, and I just want to send greetings to all of you from Pastors Jason and Monica and their family. And they are uh, enjoying their time out on the road and their vacation. And they do miss us and they can't wait to join us again. So we are in week three of our series, The Connected Church. We've been examining the Acts 2 church, uh, taking a look at things they were connected to that transformed believers then, and will do the same for us now. And our main passage has been Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. If you want to follow along, it's found on page 1408 of the Gray Bibles and the pews in front of you. We've talked, just to bring you up to speed until this point, we've talked about the importance of being connected to God, and that is our first and highest priority. And then secondly, that we are to be in the importance of the community of Christ. We are to be in communion and in active sharing and participation with each other. And both of these themes are going to carry forward into today's message. I'm actually going to add a couple of verses from uh, the end of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost to our reading today. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 2, but we'll start earlier at verse 40. And it says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So there are two things that the early church was connected and obedient to that we find in these verses. The first is water baptism. The second is Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Both were established by Christ with instruction given to the apostles. Baptism and communion are ordinances given to the church uh, that are explicitly prescribed in Scripture for the life and faith of believers. Now, some of you may be thinking, I just read that whole passage. I didn't see a single thing in there about communion. Where are you getting that from? So let's take a look again at verse 42 where it states they were devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So the author of the book of Acts is Luke, the same Luke who is the author of the Gospel of Luke. Now, Luke uses a very specific Greek word that gets translated as breaking. That word is klosis, and it's used twice in his writings, and only twice. And since uh, Scripture helps us interpret Scripture— we can look at Luke chapter 22 to find the answer. And in Luke chapter 22, we see the establishment of the Lord's Supper where Jesus breaks bread. So we use what is clear there to help us better understand what is less clear here. And so we can know that this breaking of bread in verse 42 more than likely refers to the Lord's Supper, a.k.a. communion. Now, Quick disclaimer, I could talk forever about both of these topics, uh, and if I'm not careful, I will. Uh, both baptism and communion, they're these incredibly spiritually and traditionally and theologically rich practices. They have a history and a purpose, and they have symbolism that's traced all the way back to the earliest writings of the Old Testament. And this morning, uh, really what I'm going to do is take a very bird's eye view of those and look more contextually as it fit within the Acts 2 church and for us here. And so there's no question that Jesus established both of these practices, right? In both Matthew 26 and Luke 22, we see the Lord's Supper. This practice is continued by the apostles. It's been continued by the church as a remembrance of Christ's suffering and looking forward to the joy that's to come. We also see in Matthew 28 that Jesus gives direct instruction to the apostles regarding evangelism and baptism. Matthew 28, 19, he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, there it is, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we love Jesus, we keep his commands. And these practices were essential to the early church. They've been sustained by the church for nearly 2,000 years, and they are still relevant and essential for us today. And we know from reading this passage that the early church was a tight-knit, supportive, and involved community. They were in communion with each other, as we discussed last week. And both baptism and communion were essential pieces of that community communion with each other. Now, speaking very broadly, we can understand 
baptism as symbolizing the entrance into that communion. And we understand the Lord's Supper as the sustaining of that communion. Additionally, these ordinances are necessary because they regularly remind us as believers of the good news that is the gospel. And we can never, ever afford to forget the gospel, and both of these practices serve as regular reminders of it. So everybody who repents and believes in Christ as Lord and Savior are to be baptized. Because by their baptism, they are declaring that they have died with Christ, they have been raised to new life in him, born again to walk in new life. So baptism is the outward demonstration of the inward faith. We're saved by the blood of Christ, right? That same blood that cleanses our consciences and redeems us. But baptism symbolizes the beginning of that spiritual life. We see in the New Testament that everybody who entered the community of the church believed and then were baptized as soon as possible. And so water baptism is a physical and public declaration of the spiritual reality that has already taken place. And it also serves as a declaration to declare to the world that, yes, I am a Christian. The old me has died and I have been made new in Christ. Now, additionally, Christ himself was baptized. And quick disclaimer, he had no sin to repent of. His baptism was a little bit different. There was no washing away of what came before because he was fully man and fully God. The first, um, the first reality is that his baptism was to anoint his role and his ministry. His baptism set the model and the example for us, is to, fo- to, us to follow as believers, and then it served to identify himself with sinners. Not that Christ ever had or ever would sin, But rather, as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So ultimately, baptism's necessary. Not fully in the sense that we are unsaved without it, right? Because if I just go dunking people in Lake Michigan, that doesn't mean that they're saved. It just means that I got them wet. That's probably not very nice. Rather, we're faced with three realities regarding it, though. The first is that Jesus very clearly told us to baptize people. The second is that Jesus himself was baptized. So with these two alone, who are we to sit back and go, "Ah, that's not for me. Yeah, my God did it. Yeah, he set the example. I know he told me to do it, but I'm just going to be disobedient in that way. Good luck with that. The third reality is that it's the public declaration of repentance, being washed of our sin and stepping into life in Christ, meaning that it's our bold and faithful declaration that we are indeed part of the church, that it's not a secret. We are citizens of heaven. We are members of the body. We are part of the community that is Christianity. It's a a declaration out loud that this is who we are. These are our people. This is who God is and what he's done for me. And this is the spiritual body we are uniting ourselves to. And so we understand baptism as that representation of us stepping into communion or fellowship with God. We step into fellowship and communion with the body of the church. And from there, we are to regularly practice the Lord's Supper, a.k.a. Holy Communion. Now, this supper consists of two elements. It's the bread and the fruit of the vine. All of it is a memorial of Christ's suffering. It's a sharing in the divine nature, and it is a prophecy of his second coming. Now, we're not given express instruction in the Bible on how often we are to share in communion. We are simply told that whenever we share in it, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The bread and the fruit of the vine, the juice, represent the new covenant established by Christ. See, in the Old Testament, the Israelites restored their relationship to God through animal sacrifice. Under the new covenant, there is only one sacrifice given for all, and that is Christ Jesus. So the purpose of the Lord's Supper, the purpose of these elements, is that of fellowship. See, whenever believers participated in communion, they did it as a community. They were gathered in each other's houses for feasting, eating with glad and sincere hearts. And while they were gathered together, they then participated in the Lord's Supper as one. And so Holy Communion is meant for the believers who are already in communion with each other and with God. And this idea, as we discussed last week, of communion is more than just an acquaintance meeting. It's, hey, we kind of like the same God, so I guess we'll hang out. It is a deep sharing. It is an active participation. It is a giving of self in fellowship. And there are no 
explicit instructions given in the Bible on who is to lead communion or where it can be participated in, not that I have found. And we only receive instructions on the elements, the bread and the fruit of the vine. We receive instruction on proper behavior regarding communion and proper conduct of communion itself. And church history shows that believers actually would bring communion to those who are physically unable to be at the gathered body of Christ. And there are some denominations that still do this today because for them, the practice of communion was vital for the unified communion of the body. And it reminds the gathered body that we are unified together and unified to God. So I want to offer a challenge and an encouragement this morning. We always encourage the people watching with us online to grab elements from their home to join us in communion. But what if people from here recognized who wasn't here and got in touch with them and joined them in their homes or invited them to your own to share in communion together? To share with those who are physically unable to be here and remind them and remind ourselves that though they cannot be physically present, they are still unified with us as part of the body. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17, uh, the Apostle Paul writes the following, where he says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So I'm going to revisit my ancient Greek lesson from last week. Uh, the word translated as fellowship in Acts chapter 2 is, does, any, does anybody remember? Koinonia. The word in 1 Corinthians 10 that gets translated into English as participation is the same word. The body of Christ is to be in fellowship with each other, and by the practice of the Lord's Supper, we are affirming our communion, our koinonia, our fellowship with God. In the Old Testament, the Israelites would actually consume parts of sacrifices as a way of restoring their fellowship to God who they sinned against. And so when we share in communion today, these elements represent Christ, the one and all sacrifice, and all of our sharing in the Lord's Supper reminds us and represents the restoration of our fellowship to God. And that's what it firstly reminds us of, right? We are remembered that we are first connected to God, that we are with him, unified with him, in fellowship with him. His spirit lives within us. It also reminds us of our fellowship with all who share the faith and every believer of all time. Like, the, like, think about this for a second. Paul says that we are of one body, meaning that we're not partaking in a separate gospel, a separate good news from believers who came 2,000 years before us, that it reminds us that not only are we in fellowship with the community of believers here and now, but that we are unified to the global church body that has an incredible lineage that has shaped and sculpted history. And this fellowship, this being together was actually so important that the Apostle Paul rebukes the Corinthian church for defiling that fellowship with each other. In chapter 11, verses 17 through 21, he gives this rebuke. He says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Sarcasm from Paul. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, you, some of you, go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? And what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. What we read in this chapter very often is that those who eat or drink in an unworthy manner bring judgment on themselves. It means we examine our conscience. It means we confess sin. It also means that we dishonor the practice of communion if we are also not in communion with each other as a church. See, the feasts that involved the Lord's Supper in the New Testament had believers committing injustices by consuming unequal food and provisions. The community didn't care for each other the way the Acts 2 community was caring for each other. And they were rebuked by Paul partly because they allowed themselves to be divided and they defied that koinonia, that fellowship that they were supposed to be unified in. And again, in those words, there is one loaf. 
We who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. No matter where we share in it, whether it's here, whether it's at home, we are reminding ourselves of our unity with every other believer, that this represents the same sacrifice every single time. And we are to share in this regularly with each other, in fellowship with each other. That can be here at church. That can be wherever the body of Christ gathers so long as we treat it with the proper reverence and respect that it deserves, right? Because worship's not accidental. We can't accidentally worship other gods. We also can't accidentally worship our own God. And simply going through the form and the process of communion or form and the process of baptism without the actual saving faith behind it means nothing for us spiritually, right? If that were the case, if I could just drink some juice and eat some bread and ha-ha, I've taken communion, we'd see a lot more revivals happening at Olive Garden. <laughs> this, this fact, this spiritual reality behind it is also why unbelievers can't share in communion with us. Because they're not in communion with Christ. And until they are, there is no communal meal for them to share in. Right? By sharing in this as a body, we remind ourselves that this is who we are. These are our people. This is who our God is and what he has done for us. And this is the spiritual body we've united ourselves to. The beauty of communion, it's not just found in our fellowship to each other. It's found in our fellowship and our unity with God, right? Because the Holy Spirit is present in each of us as believers. We are a spiritual house or temple for God, and he is present with us when we assemble together. This also means that Jesus is the unseen host of every Lord's Supper, every communion we share in. See, the early church understood that there was a kind of divine mystery at play where Christ was present in the process. We understand that what these are, they're symbolic and they're a remembrance of Christ's body and blood, but that being said, when we share in it, Christ is with us because he's been with us since we started worship this morning. He is the host of the table that we are coming together to eat at. And this is why we need to treat communion with the reverence and the respect that it deserves because to dishonor the supper is to dishonor the host who provided it for us. Right? I don't go to your house and disrespect you and then expect you to share in a meal with me. I don't irreverently treat your home and your place of being with dishonor. I don't allow myself to go in and start conflict and then sit down and go, let's, let's join together in fellowship. If we can't do it out there, we can't do it with God. And so wherever and whenever we share in communion, we are to be unified with each other. That we are to be reminded of our union with God. And so however we participate, wherever we participate, we do it with reverence, with contemplation, and we do it with thanksgiving. I'll teach you one more Greek word this morning. The Greek word for thanksgiving is Eucharistia, which is actually why some churches refer to communion as the Eucharist. It's derived from that origin. When we share in communion together, we thank God for his blessings. We express gratitude for his sacrifice on the cross, for the blood that was shed that washed us clean, that we thank him for that same spiritual cleansing that is also symbolized by baptism. And so we remember his sacrifice, we remember what was done for us, we joyfully look forward to what is to come because it's also occasion for us to remember and look forward to the fact that God will return and we will eventually rejoice, as Pastor Jason taught from Revelation 19, we will rejoice in the marriage supper of the Lamb, fully one with God. And so these ordinances were essential for the Acts 2 church, they've been essential for 2,000 years, and they are essential for us now. They are physical practices that symbolize and publicly represent profound and powerful spiritual realities. Now, personally, my favorite thing about communion is that it preaches the gospel to us over and over and over again. And we should never, ever get sick of hearing the gospel. It should never become tired old news to us. If you show me a Christian who thinks I've heard the gospel enough times, I will show you a Christian who needs to hear it again. Because the gospel gives us life. It humbles us. It changes our lives, and it changes the lives of everyone around us. And every declaration of the gospel should be met with a resounding and hearty yes and amen. With every baptism, we are reminded of God's saving grace in our own lives. We're reminded of the joy that we first had when we were raised to new life in him. 
We get to sit and witness beautiful testimonies of God's mercy and his power and his provision and his forgiveness and faithfulness. We celebrate together rejoicing in every soul that has been born again, that soul who joins us in worshipful fellowship here and now and will continue with us in worshipful fellowship in heaven. And every time we share in communion, we preach the gospel to ourselves. We are reminded exactly what it took to pay the price for our sin. Communion reminds us that our faith is not some ethereal and bloodless thing. That the only resolution to our problem of sin in the world resulted in the shedding of pure and innocent blood for you and for me. That broken body, that spilled blood, it paid the price that you and I never could to restore us to proper communion with God. It is, in a sense, the manna that gets us to heaven as we wander the wilderness that he is here on earth, as we await the promised land, this is our spiritual nourishment. And the best part is that it doesn't matter what I've done. Good, bad, everything in between, my successes, my failures, none of it matters during communion. Only Christ is who matters. So I can come into this building thinking I'm the greatest, that I can be riding high on my own accomplishments, proud of the work that I've done or the kind of man that I am. And then I come here and I hold it and I remember my sin was the cause for the death of the only truly innocent person to walk this earth. And I remember that none of my accomplishments, none of my self-righteousness have bought me an ounce of merit to deserve entering heaven. Yet by his body and by his blood, a way has been made for you and for me. And at the same time, it doesn't matter how awful I feel. I can come here today feeling like the worst. I can feel like a failure of a father or a husband or a pastor. I can look at my life in frustration and sorrow. I can feel like I've lost or I'm losing everything. And in that moment, when I remember Christ, I hear the words of my God break through the noise that this is my body given for you. And so we're going to end today by sharing communion together as a family. And I would encourage all of us to share in this as often as we can. The ushers are going to come around and they're going to distribute the communion elements to all of you. If you're watching online, I would encourage you to grab the bread and the juice that you have at home to participate. But I want to encourage the body once more to recognize who isn't here and extend that fellowship, extend that communion to them by going and joining and offering to share in it with them. Meet together and share these elements as one. Now, as the ushers make their way around, I mentioned earlier that communion is for the believer. It's a sharing of a meal and a participation in fellowship with God. And so before I lead us in communion, I want to create an opportunity for those outside of the feast to join us at the table. For the rest of us, For those of us who are already believers, who have already been repented and baptized, this is the time to examine our consciences, to take these symbols and to revere this sharing together with the reverence and the thanksgiving that it deserves. See, in the word of God, it's written. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. The reality is is that we must consider ourselves. Wherever we're at, whatever we've done this week, that we are to engage in the regular practice of confessing our sin as believers. It's written in James 5. And so, if you are a believer, if you have done anything that still requires confession and repentance, now is the chance. Now is the time to examine ourselves before we participate. And with every head bowed and with every eye closed, I want to extend an invitation to those here who have not yet stepped into that faith, who have not yet stepped into that communion. That this is the gospel, that God came to earth as a man to live the life you could never live, to die the death that you should have died. He was raised to life on the third day, taking the keys to death and Hades in his hands. And all who repent, all who confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead will be saved. 
And if that needs to be you this morning, no one placing pressure on you, I just want you to raise your hand to just make that confession between you and God that yes, this is me, this is what I'm stepping into. Thank you guys. I'm going to lead us in a prayer that much like, much like the form of baptism and the form and the process of communion, that if we don't mean these words, if we don't have the repentant and faithful spirit behind it, it'll do nothing for us, and yet it means everything if we do. So please repeat after me. Jesus, I admit that I have sinned, and I have fallen short of your plans for me. I confess my sin to you, and I accept your forgiveness. I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. Amen. So we are going to share in communion together if you want to prepare yourselves. In the word of God, it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we come before you with humble hearts, with thankful hearts, grateful for what you have done, grateful for who you are, grateful that your body that was given for us, reminding us of the depth of your love. Lord, that you loved us so much that you came and were willing to be broken and bleed out for the sins of man to pay the atoning price for each of us. We remember what you've done and we look forward to the joy that is to come in you. May I receive the bread this morning. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that is what we do this morning, Father. We remember your death. We remember your sacrifice. We thank you for the atonement. We thank you for the grace that restores us to fellowship with you. We thankfully thank you for the healing that is provided by you, by your stripes that we are healed, Lord, that your blood was poured out for us to be restored to you spiritually physically, mentally, Lord, that we have everything that we need in you, that we need nothing else. And we know this serves as a reminder of your mercy poured out for each and every one of us, Lord. It's in your name we pray. You may receive the cup this morning. Father, we thank you for this coming together, this opportunity to fellowship with each other, to fellowship with you. May we continue to fellowship with each other beyond these four walls, to seek your presence, to seek your face, to dive truly deeper into what it means to be in communion, Lord. Father, we do all of this as an act of worship to honor you and to glorify you. So if you would all join me in standing, we are going to join together for one last song of worship thanking God for all he has done, thanking God for all he is doing, thanking God for all that he is going to do. Stepping out in faith and remembering all that has been given for us and praising him for his glory and for his goodness. And I would encourage every single one of you, part of being in community, part of being in communion is to go and fellowship with each other outside of here. And if there's someone who wasn't here this morning, who you know that they either can't be here or weren't able to make it, find a time, find a way to share in this fellowship communion with them, to bring communion to them and remind them that they are united to God and they are still united to us as a body, though there may be physical barriers that keep them from being here. There are no spiritual barriers that keep us from being part of the body of Christ. Let's sing together this morning.